Okay, constructivism, social constructivism, and learner centeredness. Thank you, everyone, for coming this week. Um, I had my mic on mute for the last 15 minutes, so uh, I'm going to go a little faster through this and redo this. Back 20 years ago, when I was an accountant, you know, we were very behaviorally driven, very behavioral approaches to instruction. When I got a chance, advisors. Thinking back 20 years ago, my father never wanted me to go to Madison. He thought I'd become a hippie. I don't know how he had that idea at all that I would become a hippie, but maybe I did. Well, anyways, I studied educational psychology. I studied educational technology. I studied instructional design. Oh, those great instructional design books like that from Charlie Regaluf, his green and yellow books. When I got there and read his green and yellow books, I found that some things that were in the green and yellow books were more behaviorally based. Some, at least one or two chapters, were more constructivistically based. We were moving from, at the time 20 years ago, from behavioral paradigms to cognitive ones and on to constructivistic ones. So we're moving away from traditional instruction, SR instruction, and the ADDIE model in particular, pre-prescribing instruction, and Gagné's model, which we'll cover later, gaining attention, informing learners of objectives, stimulating recall, presenting stimulus, providing feedback, very chain-like step-by-step approaches to instruction, to open-ended ones like Alan Collins, where we have learners who learn based on what's meaningful to them. So we've basically we've been shifting from pre-prescribed instructional content to that in which is more inquiry-based, more guided by the instructor, more learner-centered instruction, if you will. And so we're constantly shifting in that learning environment. And that's true here in this learner-centered approach to instruction that's become popular today. We've moved away from behavioral approaches, pre-prescribed curriculum, this uh, slot machine notion that we treat all students as, you know, as if they're in a casino that we reinforce, or they're in a factory in which we move them through step by step by step to more open-ended, more choices. And the Web 2.0 in particular offers us that opportunity to get students into environments that are potentially self-enriching, student-generated, student-participatory environments. We're moving away from learning being external and imposed on learners, where the mind processes symbols, to an, an idea where learners interpret, build, construct, produce, self-determine their own learning. That learning grows out of personal experiences. That learning grows out of personal constructions of reality. That it's no longer machine-like, external, and imposed by someone on them. We're moving from a behavioral approach, a linear approach, a focus on mastery of content that's been reshaped and created by someone, an instructional designer or a teacher, to someone who self-determines their own learning, who has a choice within one's learning environment that, you know, where learning, in effect, um, is no longer looked at as just teaching, but in fact, today, learners have a chance to self-determine part of, at least a piece of their learning path and get involved in real-world situations and experiences. And this has been talked about for a long time, the work of William James, the work of Dewey, John Dewey, Vygotsky, Piaget, Kuhn, and Kant have all been based on constructivistic ideas where the learner is, in fact, a pilgrim on a journey, wherein the teaching methods that are most important are those that have a soft touch in guiding learning in stimulating their motivational processes to get them redirected on a learning path, potentially, Instruct, instruction isn't unimportant. Instructivism isn't unimportant. It's just the fact that it should be maybe 15, 20, 25, or maybe five, just 5% 5 of the curriculum should be direct instruction or lectures like this. You notice in this class you have these lectures to watch. You have a book. You have discussion online. You have your assignments. You have um, your resources that you can engage in, your cool resources. There's so many other things besides a lecture. You have your own personal reflections. You have the videos from YouTube. We've moved this to being a learning environment as opposed to a place of direct instruction. You don't have to watch any of these, in fact, to learn this uh, material for this class. You can pick and choose what you want. 
as opposed to saying that everybody has to go through this lecture or that lecture or this event or that event. Now, with unlimited storage online, we can make all sorts of pallets of information available. So constructivism is part of that, where we make available learning for students when they want to learn, right? We're minimalist in terms of instruction. It's still important to teach, and I like to teach and, and instruct, but it's also important to give options on the learning path, to let students check their learning against what they think they know, to let them construct new realities and share what they've learned and compare that to other people's learning. Learners, from a constructivism po point of view, use their experiences to actively construct understandings and make sense of them rather than having them pre-ordered, pre-delivered, and so forth. Learners construct understanding. Learners learn about new information based on their current interests and what's meaningful to them, what's authentic for them, based on their social endeavors with other people. Three dimensions. Concern about individual versus lack of concern. Knowledge imposed versus instructed, social versus individual. There are various conceptions of constructivism. Some theories of constructivism are very individually based. They're, they're very um, much concerned about the individual as opposed to the so, looking at social aspects, looking at the, the organization of groups, collaborations among team members, and how we move from collaboration in a group to individual understanding like the Vygotskyan models. So construct, constructivism is concerned with the act of constructing meaning. Um, the constructivist argues that the child's mind actively constructs relationships and ideas and negotiates and generates new ones. Okay, So we want to build on what students already know, their prior knowledge, their interests, their learning activities. We want to have them dialogue with others. We want to have them discuss and debate we want to have them have a chance for um, uh, discussing with other people what they think is important. Okay, So all this is part of a constructivistic approach to learning. And I think that's, that's potentially you know, what, what all of us would like to have in, uh, with our students in their classroom settings. To have a se session where you pose contradictions, you have dialogue. You have discussion. You have debate. You access raw data and resources, right? And you you go from what students already know. You go from their um, prior knowledge to new knowledge. You give them some sense of say in that curriculum, some autonomy, some choice, and self-directedness. So we're building on, we're moving from these states. We're moving from... Um, student prior knowledge. We're moving from uh, the, the choices that students have made towards making sense of the curriculum within those choices, using inquiry and then adding questions and Socratic questioning, giving some autonomy but still structuring or bringing them back in. So it's a combination approach. So constructivist isn't total free-for-all. It's not chaos. It's organized. Organized chaos. I mean, it's, it's really the art of teaching is this, this notion in between where you give students choice and where, in fact, you, you don't give them much choice. So it's, a, it's kind of a combination in between the two. Where you, you, manip, you push them, you nudge them, you prod them. You know, children should be exploratory creatures, and we should help them discover truths. It's more powerful when they discover it than when we tell them what the truth is. Situated learning asserts that learning is mo most authentic in real-world environments and more authentic world environments, allowing students to generate their own solutions. So, in effect, what we just saw is that constructivism is more focused on what we do, our constructions. Situated learning is, mo is more concerned about that context, that event, that real world experience. Well, personally, I don't see a whole lot of difference between the term situated learning and constructivism. I see them as fairly similar in nature, and so might you. So um, people ask me all the time, what is situated learning? What is constructivism? They're fairly similar entities. 
So we've got people who are known for social constructivism, like Vygotsky. Uh, Piaget known more for cognitive constructivism. Vygotsky is more interested in knowledge being shared and the role of knowledge in a social environment, in a collaborative one. The teacher is very, very important in these environments. It's just the teacher role has become more diversified, uh, multifaceted, if you will. Social constructivism is looking at the mediational means or tools in our environment, looking at the maps and languages and the tools and diagrams and computer screens and so forth that might foster certain types of thinking, that might get us to, to realize we don't know everything we need to know and might show us some strategies that, that, we, did, that we need to, to learn. Um, it's concerned about zones of proximal development, and I talk about that in, in another talk. Um, internalizing strategies that we see in a physical environment. Assisted learning, how we can assist learners in learning. It gets at aspects of scaffolded learning, apprenticeship of learning or tele-apprenticeship of learning. So how can teachers, in effect, provide some layers of, of, of scaffolded assistance to help you learn? What are things that an instructor can do on a social plane to help people learn? That's, that's what gets that social constructivism. So social constructivism is concerned about intersubjectivity, what we know jointly at a point in time and how we can take certain things for granted so as to solve problems more expediently, shared knowledge, if you will. We might all know that international business machines could be um, shortened to IBM. Once you have that intersubjectivity, you know that you know that the other one knows, you can push on a little faster. Activity settings, unit of analysis, the activity setting, the, the classroom is the, the unit of analysis from a social constructivist point of view, not the individual student necessarily, okay? So um, it changes the focus. It changes the focus to the learning environment that you're trying to create or produce. As much as possible, then, instruction should be individualized, and the teacher should act as facilitator, motivating and guiding students and providing the for curriculum that allows for discovery. So we move from all teacher-centered to student-centered, and we gradually release responsibility for learning from the instructor to the teacher. We might model how to solve a problem, we might instruct, we might demonstrate, and we gradually let students take control over those models. That gets at guided learning. And in this class, and in most of my classes, I'll move from more lecture-based information at the front end to more student-driven projects on the back end. I move typically from uh, maybe tests in an undergraduate class towards more problem-based learning and presentations at the end. We're gradually releasing control to the students to take responsibility for their all learning, for their own learning. So we want to create shared spaces where that can happen, where they can negotiate problems, where they can find you know, problems with enough difficulty to challenge them, but give them challenge and choice and, and assistance within those challenges, assisted learning, structuring the tasks so that they can solve them. I believe that all teachers assist in learning. We don't need to just assess learning, but assist in the learning process by modeling, giving feedback, task structuring, questioning, managing instruction, pushing students to explore, giving questions and acknowledgments for points of view, um, many ways in which to assist in learning is figuring out how to create the structures in each particular semester that might best assist in the learning process. That's important. Resources of learning include teachers, peers, curriculum, technology, experts, assessment, self-reflection, and parents. On and on and on and on. Grandparents and so forth. Um, the funds of capital in one's community, the museums and zoos and TV stations and whatever that might impact on learning, the newspapers one reads or magazines or whatever, all are part of a learning community. And you need to think about as instructors on how to structure the community so it's not just teachers imparting to students. It's peers working with each other. It's practitioners coming in to share what they know. It's creating a learning environment where problems are solved, where problems might be anchored in a real-world community context, where students get that problem presented to them and they get ownership over the problem and the solutions to that problem over time. Authentic tasks, 
that can be solved by, by students. Not trivial things, but maybe real world problems, such as creating curriculum guides for the local community when there's a problem that exists, like PCBs in the local community that need to be uh, addressed, or you know, water pollution or whatever. Creating, having students create guidebooks for the community that could be shared and made available in dentists and doctors' offices. Okay, uh, maybe it's a road system that's being redesigned for the community, and the students might go in to um, analyze that data, look at how many cars are driving through a particular area uh, during a day, and how what possible restructuring of the roads might be made available, and making the report available for the local community. So. Collaborating on problems, uh, collecting data, drawing conclusions, sharing conclusions, creating artifacts, business plans, um, final products, books, for instance, you know, having them in a real world doing real world things. So does teaching cause learning? And if not, what does cause learning? Roland Tharp says, we see that a school is neither a community of learning nor a community of teaching in that the final common pathway of education, the teaching-learning uh, interaction, is not one of assisting performance. What he saw in observing schools in Hawaii and other places is that many times that teaching is not assisting in learning. Teaching is only about assessment of learning or about in, imparting learning and ideas, that we have to move to a frame of school and about community and about curriculum of assisting in learning, assisting in performance. He said that there are ways in which to do this. Um, we normally are using recitation scripts. We ask a question, we get an answer, and we evaluate that answer. Instead, we should focus on giving feedback, modeling, questioning, guiding, and, and basically creating an instructional conversation. And he has 10 aspects to his instructional conversation that you should take a look at, okay? Very, very, very important stuff from Tharp and Gallimore's 1988 book called Rousing Minds to Life. If we look at curriculum as an instructional conversation with our students, we might in turn create more of a collegial relationship with our students, and we might in turn have more opportunities for learning to occur. So, assisting in learning, where we're co-facilitators, co-learners. We're solving problems together and reflecting on those problems. Being more learner-centered. Now, the American Psychological Association in 1994 created a set of learner-centered principles that if you go to Google, you type in APA, American Psychological Association, and learner-centered principles, you can get those, and you can see some of their examples and, in fact, try them out in your respective classes. So there might be ways in which you could use learner-centered principles. And in 1997, they expanded on these from 12 principles to 14 principles. They get at thinking about thinking, constructing knowledge, motivating students to learn. Many of these ideas were part of 50 years of research in psychology that were summarized. And out of that 50 years of research, they came up with these learner-centered principles. Well, let's give you some applications of learner-centered principles in K-12 schools and of constructivism. Carl Breiter and Marlene Scardamelia at the University of Toronto at OISE, the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, created the computer-supported intentional learning environments back in the 80s. It was a system for students to put up papers online and share them and juxtapose their ideas against other, other people's ideas. In effect, they created a writing environment that was based on the notions of sharing, based on the notions of knowledge building. And when I saw them present, actually, with their kids in 1990-ish, um, I think it was 1991 in the fall, or 1990 in the fall, in November in Canada, a day before our election of George Bush, uh, you can wasn't a happy day for me, but the, that day they had their kids presenting what they learned. Their kids were so empowered. We're not talking about college kids. We're talking about seven, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds up presenting for them on their knowledge building experiences. So this knowledge builder, they originally called Cecil, 
They, they later changed the name from Collaborative in, Computer Supported and Intentional Learning Environments to the Knowledge Builder. And they went in schools in Toronto and Finland and other parts of the world having kids create networks of their knowledge, retrieving information, referencing, quoting, tracking, identifying knowledge gaps, getting kids to externalize their knowledge. Now, Breiter and Scardamelia were famous writing researchers who, um, like I was at the time, moved into the area of computer-based learning, web-based learning, and getting students to put their ideas up for everyone to share, reference, evaluate, and peer databases of knowledge. In effect, having problems, emphasizing problems, emphasizing collective communities, uh, collecting knowledge, sharing that knowledge in a learning community, linking knowledge, um, asking for more information within one's knowledge nodes, presenting information, giving feedback on ideas. That's one example. Another example from about the same time comes from University of Illinois. Anne Brown and Anne-Marie Pelscar created reciprocal teaching where students would get modeled by the instructor on reading techniques, on how to predict text, how to summarize, how to question, and so forth. In effect, they took good metacognitive strategies in reading and made the teacher model or demonstrate them, and gradually the student took over to be the teacher and modeled these strategies. Through reciprocal teaching, with initially 7th and 8th grade learning disabled kids, and later on kindergarten and grade 1, 2, 3 for listening skills, they were able to improve comprehension scores of all students and transfer that learning gain from reading to social studies and science. It's got the largest effect size of any strategy since I've been around, other than maybe mnemonics. Now, they, we use reciprocal teaching in college settings today. So it's a very popular method for giving students control over their curriculum, in effect, by teaching them through modeling and gradually letting them take on the role of questioner, clarificate, clarifier, predictor, summarizer of the text, gradually having students become the teacher. And it's not, if they give the, you know, um, the wrong answers or say a wrong answer is correct, that's okay. It's not the facts that are important, it's the processing of knowledge. They actually found that when kids actually you know, got less focused on the correctness of an answer, but more on the summarizing skills, the metacognitive skills, the more they learned. Foxfire is a similar approach where students see the objectives of the curriculum, of the state, with their teacher, and then they create ways in which they can address that, those objectives, address this curriculum in their own way, with their own choices, whether it's creating books, whether it's doing interviews, whatever it might be, Students in the Foxfire approach are creating tangible products. They're going into the community to interview people, interviewing experts. Maybe it's someone who's a, a radio personality or somebody who's a um, famous cook or whatever it might be. They might interview the person. They might do um, research reports. They might write books that get into dentist's office that might be published. The classroom and the community are one. Students get choice. They get a say in their curriculum. The Foxfire approach started in Georgia and it's extended around the world. Teacher's a co-learner, teacher's a collaborator, the focus is on rigorous curriculum, the focus is on um, aesthetic appreciation of products and on reflections on what students do. In this class you're doing a wiki book. Many of the things in a wiki book, actually it's an option for you, but if you did one, like we did last year, we had to do one, that would be similar to the Foxfire approach. Another approach related to constructivism is the use of anchored instruction, where students watch short video clips and you reflect on those. You see problems that are maybe being solved, and you might have math problems wrapped around those videos, or your physics problems wrapped around the videos, or economics, or whatever discipline you're teaching. We've anchored their learning in a video that everybody watches, and then you can come back to that video over and over and over, and so they can eventually have that context to come back to. It's a macro context that anchors the instruction for the student. Okay. So many of these things were created at Vanderbilt University in the late 80s, early 90s. They used the Jasper Woodbury series as a way to get people to recognize the importance of 
of anchoring learning in something common. Other things like this include um, scientific related projects like the GLOBE project, the Journey North, and the Jason project. The GLOBE project where students collect environmental data and share it with others around the world. The Journey North where you might follow experts in a community as they explore real world problems and track data and collaborate and then you might ask those experts questions as they go to the North Pole or they explore the Mayan ruins. You might ask them about the dog of the day or you might ask them about experiments that they're conducting or about the, um, the loss of the tree line as they travel across the northern tundra of Canada. Um, the Jason project where there might be an uh, expedition team that you interact with and maybe help control their submarines temporarily as you know, kids in schools. Um, virtual field trips and explorations and other things. Collecting real world scientific data in the GLOBE project or watching others do it as in the Journey North and the Jason projects and then sharing it, submitting it, analyzing it and sharing it around the world. Kids as Global Scientists, similar kind of thing. We did this back in the mid-1990s with kids in inner city Indianapolis, with Park Tudor in the suburbs, and with Helmsburg schools in the rural parts of Indiana, collecting real-world weather data, having them create real-world projects and share them, and build relationships among their projects, moving from being consumers of scientific data to being producers of it. Okay. Now, I created something back in the early 1990s called The Scale, the Social Constructivism and Active Learning Environments. We originally called it the Student Constructivism and Active Learning Environments Scale. We later changed it to the Social Constructivism. Now, Padma Maduri, my graduate student at West Virginia, where I was in the early 90s, um, helped me collect data in India, of all places, as our first study. And then later, when I got to Indiana, uh, Elizabeth Oyer and I created data, or collected data in rural Indiana schools uh, and suburban schools in um, the Indianapolis area and in the Bloomington area. Now I had eight subscales like clarification, elaboration, and explanation, the extent to which students are provided with explanations, examples, and multiple understandings of a difficult problem. I also had subscales related to student autonomy, scaffolding, meaningfulness, generating connections, discussion, media, and collaboration. For instance, in in my classes, students have a say in class activities and tests. You would answer very often, often, sometimes, seldom, or never. In my classes, I help students explore, build, and connect ideas. In my classes, students share their ideas and views with me. In my classes, students can relate new terms and concepts to events in their lives. In my classes, students work in small groups. They use computers to help them organize. I give hints and cues for solving problems. As you get responses to those questions, you can then understand what's going on, what the teacher thinks they're doing, and you could compare it to what they'd like to do, their future, and look for the gaps in between, or look at what students think are happening and what teachers or students would like to have happen and look at the gaps in between there as well. And you can look at how much gap exists for students and how much gaps teachers think, and you'll see there's a significant difference that what teachers think they're doing in the classroom is vastly different from what students think is happening. And the degree of constructivism in classes in Indiana, we found, went down over time. It got worse from elementary school to high school settings. The degree of ownership went down. And there were differences, male and female, in terms of gender-related information. So a little summary of constructivism. Knowledge is negotiated. Cognition is distributed. Cognitive conflict is important. Raw data drives lessons. Teachers are moving to facilitators, and peers are important to learning. These are all factors of constructivism that we've seen. Um, benefits of constructivism, higher test scores when they're active, more transfer to the real world, more engagement in learning, and potential for more creativity and communication. Criticisms of this constructivism are that it's an elitist approach to learning, that it won't work for all learners, especially disadvantaged youth. When in fact, some studies out there show that using accelerated curriculum or enriched curriculum, creativity-based curriculum for advanced students works just as well, if not even better, for those students that are not in the advanced groups. Okay? Others believe it's a socialist agenda, it's Marxist, it's liberal. There's all sorts of labels placed on it. Um, ivory Tower, uh, it won't work given all the masses of information that the state and the federal government requires of me. Implementation, 
of, of constructivist curriculum? Well, there are many ways to implement it. Reflection is important, in encouraging choice and giving students options, uh, creating cross-cultural collaborative teams, maybe signing up for ePals or KeePals or one of the websites for, for international collaboration, or the GLOBE project or Global Scientist project, Kids as Global Scientists, K, uh, KGS. Sign up for one of those. Get kids involved in inter interdisciplinary global education. Pose problems around big ideas and have students form teams to solve problems and present their solutions to problems. Give them something that has an audience beyond the instructor. Give them something that, that maybe two classes are solving together and there's at least two instructors looking at their work or, or bringing parents in to see their final day projects, inviting them into your classroom or having them go into a community or presenting to the local parent groups. Looking for evidence of learning. How do we know that students know that they know? I mean, how do we know? Well, you can pose a problem and see their solutions. You can have them argue and debate information. You can have them explain what they know. Ask, have them ask for and receive help. Provide ways in which to show what they know. Concept maps, timelines, taxonomies, databases, interviews, class projects, you know, discussion threads, blogs and journals, all ways to show what they know. Mock trials and scenarios, creating portfolios of what they know, synthesizing across all their works, creating summary activities or, or drafts of information that then is shared, uh, you know, creating exhibits of their knowledge, galleries, gallery tours, posting them on the walls of your room and then having people come to their own poster sessions and sharing those, in effect, those samples of their work. Synthesis, synthesize across papers that they've done. Maybe skits and role plays and debates and variety shows, advertisements, all sorts of things to get students into products and doing something and engaging in their own learning. There are many things and many ways in which you can get students to show you that they know, show you that they understand the content of what you're trying to teach. Okay, let's take a little quiz here and call it the end of today after the quiz. We're going to look at three things. We're going to look at cognitive constructivism, social constructivism, and learner-centeredness. Now, keep in mind I haven't taught you all these principles. I'm Partly this test is to get you to think about the differences between the three. It's sort of a test and sort of instruction simultaneously. So I'm kind of embedding two things together here in one situation. Okay. So just keep that in mind. It's sort of a test, but it's sort of a continuation of the lecture. So don't feel dumb if you don't get any of these right. But hopefully you'll get 30% right because, hey, it's a one out of three chance. Okay, which of these? Cognitive constructivism, social constructivism, or learner-centeredness? Build not just on what the individual student knowledge, but on common interests and experiences. Hmm. Who has an answer to that question? Anyone? Anyone? Learner-centered principles. Take a look at APA, American Psych Association, learner-centered principles. Number two, mind is in the head, not in your heart, not in your wrist. Mind's in your head, hence the learning is on the active cognitive reorganization. Sure sounds like cognitive constructivism to me. It's Piagetian, and we'll get that in another lesson. Piaget focused on individuals constructing knowledge. The learner's creativity, high order thinking, natural curiosity, all contribute to motivation to learn. Intrinsic motivation is stimulated by tasks of optimal novelty, difficulty, relevance of personal interests, and providing personal choice and control. Now let me give you a hint that most of these long ones relate to learner-centered principles, and hence it is. It's one of the learner-centered principles. Number four, the successful learner can link new information with existing knowledge in meaningful ways. The successful learner can link new information with existing knowledge in meaningful ways. Both the cognitive constructivists, the Piagetian camp, and those from the Learner Center Principles, I would accept either answer. Uses raw data or primary data sources, manipulatives, and interactive materials. That's a focus of the cognitive constructivist camp of an individual using the data in your environment to solve a problem and interact. 
but it isn't necessarily just the cognitive constructivist out there. You could have said social constructivist and learner center principles. It's pretty common. Focus is on assess, focus of assessment is on individual cognitive development within defined stages. Sounds fairly Piagetian or cognitive constructivist to me. Number seven, fosters student collaboration and negotiation of meaning. Consensus building, joint proposals, pro-social behaviors, conflict resolution, and general social interaction. Social constructivism. Now we're getting into the Vygotskyan camp, where we have students socially interacting with other people. Design lessons to address students. Previous misconceptions, for instance, by posting contradictions to the original hypotheses and then inviting responses. Sounds sort of cognitive constructivist. Again, it's individuals exploring, and then we pose contradictions to get them to a state of disequilibrium, and then to have them accommodate and assimilate new schema. I'm going across various lectures in this answer to internalize new information. Number nine, the mind is located in the social interaction setting. It emerges from acculturation into an established community of practice. Okay? That sounds very Vygotskyan in nature. Let's take a look at the answer. And indeed it is. It's social constructivist, the Vygotskyan camp. Number 10, set appropriately high and challenging standards for assessing the learner as well as learning process, including diagnostic, process and outcome assessments that are integral parts of the learning process. Sounds like learner-centered principles because it's a long one. And sure enough, there it is. Number 11, organize information around concepts, problems, questions, themes, interrelationships, framing activities, classify, predict, summarize. The kind of constructivists would say that. Organizing around concepts, themes, interrelationships, helping people frame and, and, and internalize new knowledge. Create a classroom ethos, an atmosphere where there's joint responsibility for learning. Students are experts and having, have learning um, ownership, meaning is negotiated. The participation structures are understood and ritualized. Technology and other resource explorations used to facilitate idea generation and the knowledge building in this community of peers. Now, I said most of these long ones are social constructivists. Well, not this one. This one's, I said mean, most of the longs are learner center principles. This one's social constructivist. Okay? We've got all these things that relate to us, social environments. Number 13, learning is influenced by social interactions and relations and communications with others. Learner center principles. One of the 14 key ones. Learning is most effective when differences in learners' linguistic, cultural, and social backgrounds are taken into account. The learner center principles, although also the social constructivist camp. We want to want to create a learning environment where all students can learn, no matter what their backgrounds and what their cultural heritage is. The successful learner, number 15, over time with support and instructional guidance can create meaningful, coherent representations of, of knowledge. Social constructivist. Sounds sort of kind of constructivist as well, but with guidance. Here's, here's the notion of guidance, meaningful learning, support over time. We're going to create. So it's a social. We move from the social to the personal. Provide time for instructional materials and discovery of information and ideas. Encourage students to generate knowledge, make connections, metaphors, build their own learning products. It sounds cognitive constructivist in nature, a Piagetian approach to learning. You notice there's a, quite a bit of overlap between these different methods. I mean, the, the cognitive constructivist camp and the social constructivist camp, you know, from my standpoint, it's all one ha happy family. Authors debate this over and over and over and over. So, anyhow, I don't want to debate. I just want to move on and make learning better, and I'm sure you do too. So, providing problem steps, hints, clues, problems. Uh, you know, this is a Vygotsky in nature. We're going to hint, prompt, probe. Tharp and Gallimore said assist in learning, give explanations and elaborations and clarification. My scale is part of that. Yeah, social constructivist. Foster opportunity for reflection on skills uh, to learn. So um, on skills to manage one's learning, helping students understand and become self-aware of one's own learning, from planning to learning performance, giving a focus on individual mental activity, the importance of cooperative learning, peer interaction, modeling, is cognitive constructivism. Interesting.
reflection on what you learned at the end. Number 19, learning environments should reflect real-world uh, complexities, allow students to explore specializations, solve real-world career problems, foster knowledge depth, social constructivism. Finally, number 20, the individual develops as we develop, there are different opportunities and constraints on learning. Learning is most effective when development within and across physical, intellectual, emotional, and social domains is taken into account. That's the learner center principles. So how will you use constructivism and social constructivism? That's up to you. You've got many opportunities. I've given you a number of examples with reciprocal teaching, the Foxfire approach, kids as global scientists, a knowledge builder, the knowledge forum idea, the journey north, problem-based learning. I mean, there's just so many ways and things that you can do.